Welcome to Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews, the only show that's going to teach you how to be somebody. Where in your life did you learn that you're not good at Take what you're most passionate about and what you're most fearful of. What is the plan to overcome that fear and what is the plan to enact that passion? Welcome to Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews. I am your host, AJ Armstrong. You can follow me on Instagram at AaronArmstrong33, or you can go to my website, AaronJArmstrong.com. Guys, today I have been looking forward to this speaker all week. I'm so excited we finally got this guest on our show. So this is J.R. Martinez, who I'm on the call with. He's an actor, best-selling author, motivational speaker, an advocate, and a wounded U.S. Army veteran. He is full of just positive energy. And I, you know, you guys know me, I love when we can get these positive workers in our world here. So I'm so excited to learn from him. You might recognize him from his best-selling book, a New York Times bestseller, Full of Heart. He's also been, he's shown up on Dancing with the Stars. He's shown up on some soap operas, a whole bunch of other TV shows as well. So I am just, we're going to go, if I could list this guy's resume, it would just be off the page. So thank you so much for coming on the show, JR. And let's dig into all this stuff coming up here. Man, I'm afraid to speak now after that introduction. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up, man. Like you put me on this huge pedestal. Like I'm like I'm this grand, you know, like statue, man. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't want to potentially disappoint the listeners. But no, no thank you for no that way. introduction. It's, it's, it's great to be on the show, man, and, and have the opportunity to just kind of chat and see what we can share with the listeners. Yeah, I, I'm so, so happy to have you on. So, um, so I want to hear, you know, just kind of going back, JR, to your childhood a little bit and telling us kind of what you were like. And then obviously, we're going to talk about what happened while you were in the military. But I want to start with your childhood and, and tell me a little about you growing up. Yeah, man, I think that that's great. I think a lot of people, unfortunately, they, they tend to uh, think that the starting point for my life, especially the last 16 years, was <laughs> what happened to me in the military. And I always tell people, it's like, well, there, you know, there was a whole life before that, right? Like, there, <laughs> right. You know, there was a whole, there was a whole you know, process that essentially helped me develop into the person that would be able to overcome what I call the biggest boom in my life. Um, so growing up, I mean, I was born in Louisiana and, you know, uh, unfortunately this is too com- too common of a story. Uh, I think there probably a lot of listeners can relate to this, but I found myself falling into that category of where my father, you know, left when I was nine months old. So I was raised by a single, you know, a single mother. Um, I was the only child. Um, and then at the age of nine, my mom picked me up and we moved to Arkansas. And I got there at the age of nine and completely hated it uh, because, <laughs> I, you know, just being the new kid on the block. I mean, kids have a tendency, man. I don't know why kids do this. I mean, I don't know if it's a territorial thing, but you know, they have a tendency to, you know, kind of pick on you and just kind of almost maybe show you kind of who's the boss around here. And, you know, of course I hated that. And, um, cause I was always this kid, like this, this upbeat, high energy, you know, always smiling, you know, my mom tells the, 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 you know, she always tells people that, you know, when I was a kid and, you know, I would cry in order to get me to stop crying. Um, she would, pull out a camera and pointed at me and I'd stop and I'd just start smiling. (laughs) You were always this optimist in a way. Yeah. I don't know if she was embellishing a little bit, but to some degree, like I believe like, okay, yeah, I think there's some truth to that because you know, it's just, I'm always smiling and people, one of the biggest things they always say to me is that my, my, probably my best feature that I have is my smile. And you know, I'm flattered by that, but I I really, that's, that's the type of kid that I was. And you know, got to Arkansas and then, you know, kind of quickly realized that, you know what, there's no way around this. This is going to be home for a while. So I have to find a way to kind of work through it. And needless to say, I, you know, was able to kind of make it a comfort zone. However, you know, I started to take notice by the time I got into high school that there was unfortunately some negative things that were taking place in in that small little town of, of, of hope. And I thought to myself, I remember thinking several times that if I remained in this area, um, unfortunately, I would become a product of this environment. And gotcha. so I started to kind of, you know, my, my, in my own way, start to scheme and plot maybe a way to leave Arkansas. And so I started asking my mother by the time I was a sophomore, if we can leave or relocate. And, and I asked a couple of times and she said no. And, you know, and, and um, end of my junior year, my mom comes up to me. She says, Hey, so I have a friend that lives in Georgia. Why don't we go to Georgia for like a little vacation? 
And uh, I said, okay, let's do it. And I played football growing up. And yeah. playing football in the South, I mean, especially for me in Arkansas, I always heard, I mean, football was big, but I always heard if you're going to play high school football, and there's a lot of people listening, they're going to disagree. But I heard growing up, if you're going to play high school football, you need to be in one of these three places, Texas, Florida, or Georgia. That's what I heard. <laughs> and so, you know, me having this big dream, man, of one day I'm going to be a professional football player. That was literally my thought process. Um, and, and it was incredibly naive. There was no way that was, uh, well, I'd hate to say there was no way that was ever going to happen. I just, I, I wish somebody would have sat down with me and said, okay, listen, let's look at your skill set. Let's look at your size. It's probably not going to happen, right? Like there are the, the, the rare stories of, of, of guys in the NFL that are 5'9", the same height as me, 185 pounds, and just fly. Like they, they're, they're going to make it or have yeah. a good chance. I didn't – there was no way. But it was something interesting, you know, that in the midst of me starting to kind of think about this and this process, I started to – you know, my mom said, let's go to Georgia. And I said, let's do it. Well, we were there for a couple of days. And after being there for a couple of days, um, I loved it. And I asked my mom, I said, can we move? And she said, no, you're going into your senior high school. I have a good job. No, we can't relocate. So we get home and we drove. And so we, we get home. My mom, you know, lays down, takes a nap. And she wakes up a couple of hours later uh, d literally to find me actually taking stuff off of the wall. And <laughs> like, what are you doing? I said, I'm packing. And she's like, what do you mean you're packing? Where are you going? I said, we're moving. And she said, we already talked about this. You know, you're not, we're not going anywhere. I said, hold on. You know, while you were sleeping, I figured it all out because of course, when you're that age, you know, <laughs> I everything. took the action. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, you were sleeping and I was making moves and I was making things happen. And so, um, so, you know, literally, the, this is the plan. This is the, the, what I orchestrated was very simple. Why don't I go to Georgia for two weeks? Within those two weeks, I'll try to get a job. If I don't get a job within those two weeks, then I'll come back to Arkansas and graduate high school and won't talk about moving until I'm done with high school. But if I get a job within those two weeks, and let's say I'm doing well in a month from then, then you have to move to Georgia. It was that simple. There was no you know, fine print to it. It was very clear cut to the point. And she said, deal. Okay. And I think she said deal simply for the thought process. Like, okay, he needs to learn how to appreciate where he is and me, and he's going to miss me. He's not going to make it out there in the world by himself. And sure enough, I get to Georgia. I go apply at a job. I get to a town called Dalton, which is the carpet capital of the world. It's a 90 minute drive Northwest of Atlanta, Georgia, up in that Chattanooga, Alabama, uh, kind of corner. And needless to say, fast forward a month later, I ha had had enough money to secure an apartment. So the deal was she would have to relocate and she did. And so here, yeah. here, here it is at the age of 17 years old, I now have orchestrated a move. Making from, deals. <laughs> yeah, for my mother and I. And being the one in, in some ways, which has kind of transformed into the last you know, 20, almost 20 years of my life since then. Um, it, it, the fact that the roles, like I've, like someone pointed out to me the other day that, that I went to high school with and they said, you know, JR, you, you've always kind of been to some degree, kind of like the head of the household. Like it, it, at, at a certain point, it kind of changed and your thought process, you know, kind of moved into this space. And, um, and, that, and that's exactly you know, that is indicative of that move of, of the fact that I was essentially looking for a better opportunity um, where I felt I belonged, where I felt I was welcomed, where I felt like I could see a lot of individuals that not only looked like me, um, spoke like me, maybe, you know, uh, had dreams and, and, and ambitions. Um, not to say that a lot of my friends and hope didn't, but there were a few that did it. And, and, and unfortunately, those were the few that I found myself kind of in that circle. And so, but the minute I got to Dalton, I mean, what I was able to do, Aaron, was immediately, immediately just, I mean, adapt to the scenario. I wasn't, yes, I was terrified. Yes, I was, I was nervous about the move. And of course, your senior high school, which is such a big deal. But I was able to bring kind of the basic tools and principles that allowed me to adapt and hope to Georgia and say, okay, I've done this before. 
I think if I just bring those same principles over, it'll help me adapt here. And sure enough, my senior year was probably the best year of my high school, um, you know, experience. And um, to the point where, you know, you know, it, it, but, but it's interesting. I mean, it, it's, yes, those are, the, those are, I think it's important for me to use the platform that either I have or that you're sharing with me to really talk about those first eight, within those 18 years of, of my life, of, of a lot of the adversity that I faced, you know, um, yes, my father left when I was nine months old. Unfortunately, by seeing my mother trying to develop a lot of these relationships and find love and find a positive role model for me, fell into some really bad relationships. And I saw my mother, you know, become a, a victim of domestic abuse. Um, you know, it unfortunately was the routine where when he decided to drink and decided to take out his frustrations, I, this was what I had to do. I had to go and grab the phone. I had to dial those three numbers. I had to go into a certain part of the room and hide and wait for someone to come. Um, I had to endure um, a scenario where he said that he was going to kill both her and I. Oh my um, gosh. One evening. You know, and, and, and I'm a kid and I, I'm a child and, you know, and, 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 you know, and of course the moving around was a lot of adversity. Um, Didn't you also have something happen to a sibling of yours or is that? Yeah. 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 So, so here's the, the, the really, um, the, the interesting element of my story. So my mother is from Central America, um, a small country named uh, El Salvador. And my mother um, came to this country looking for an opportunity um, you know, and had two daughters that she left behind. Um, and the whole idea for her was to come here um, to, to, to try to make enough money to, honestly, the biggest thing was she was trying to do is one of my sisters was born with an illness and where she couldn't use her legs. And so my mother was trying to buy her some sort of like a wheelchair. Um, and when my mother got here, you know, she was working, of course, met my father, then I came and I pretty much messed up the whole plan, the whole big picture, I messed it up. Um, and, and, you know, so my mother then was now having me here and not wanting to take me away from the luxury of being born in this country, Sure, was, was faced with this decision, okay, what do I do? And so she decided to remain in this country and say, well, this is my son's country and he deserves that opportunity. And in the process of going through the legal system of trying to get my sisters to come, well, it's, it's a very uh, strenuous process and an expensive one. Um, and unfortunately, my mother never got that opportunity because when I was three years old, the sister that was born with an illness passed away. And um, that was incredibly, you know, I, mean, I never met her, though. Um, I never had an opportunity to meet her. I didn't go to El Salvador until I was six years old. Uh, so three years after my sister had passed away. And, um, and, and so I, I just remember as a young boy, my mother always, you know, talking to me about my sisters and my sisters and, you know, you have sisters and you have family, right? Like not wanting me to grow up feeling alone right. and isolated. Um, and I remember the day that my mother was on the phone and she was, was received the news that her, her daughter had passed away. And I ran into the room my mom was kind of on, on the edge of the bed and, and, and uh, hunched over on the side and she was crying. And I, I said, mom, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I, you know, ran up to her and she said, remember that little you know, sister I told you? I said, yeah. She said, well, you know, she's no longer here. And, and, and I just remember just, you know, that was my mother. And I gave her a hug and I gave her a kiss and I told her I loved her and I just kind of moved on. Um, and it wasn't until I was nine years old, Aaron, that I really understood what had taken place because that was the second time I went to El Salvador. And for some odd reason, man, my mother took me, well, not, this wasn't the odd part. My mother took me to my sister's burial site. The odd part comes into play where, in the mix of me being a nine-year-old standing there, I'm suddenly overwhelmed with this emotion of not really sure of what, you know, I'm just, why I feel this way. Yeah. And overwhelmed with emotion and this I feel this incredible connection and tie to my sister well needless to say um needless to say it just it it, it just sat with me until I came back into this to the states and I just kind of moved on with my life not really knowing kind of what the point of that was that feeling that emotion that moment and we can get into later essentially what ended up how I found out later and what I believe to this day uh, is the reason and the messaging behind all of it. But, um, you know, what was really fascinating is that 
you know, when I, when, you know, when, when I, when, when you, when you compare my childhood to um, the rest of America, for example, right, they would categorize us and potentially put me in a, in a box of saying, you know, he's probably going to go down, his, this is his trajectory, this is going to be his path, this is what's going to take place, this is, you know, I heard a term once upon a time uh, at an event, a corporate event, and they, they referred to how in some areas that they refer to kids as throwaway uh, kids. And, um, and, wow. and when I heard that term, um, it, it affected me deeply because, of course, one, you know, just being able to empathize because I was one of those kids to some degree. And, um, you know, but yet we were considered poor, right, growing up. But it was fascinating that after I started going to El Salvador, you know, I was able to look at what I had in this country as an incredible luxury and richness in a sense of simply being able to go to school for free and it was mandatory, you know, versus where my family lives in El Salvador. That is a, that is a luxury. That is, that is not something you, as a right. Uh, yeah. So you have this pattern of just, you know, you have every excuse in the world as a child to, to be set up for failure in a way. And you found this positive ability, you know, you're such an optimist in that way where you're like, you know, most people would be kids. And I remember when I was high school dreading going to school. Don't get me wrong. To some degree, I didn't fully take advantage of it. Like it allowed me to appreciate, you know, being able to go to the park, right. A lot freely and play it allowed me to appreciate. Yeah. I might have to wear these same pair of pants you know, two or three times a week and just switch up the shirt so no one really knows. Or I might have to wait a few days or a few weeks to get those new pair of shoes that everyone got a lot earlier than I did. But I got them, right? Like, my mom was still creating an incredible life for me and for us, you know, with limited resources and just literally her working, you know, at times multiple jobs. And but but yes, to your point, as far as like looking at school, to some degree, you know, I didn't necessarily, I, you know, my thought process was my plan, my goals were in life were to become this professional football player. Never did I understand or uh, was informed the importance of school and academics. I, that to me, there was no correlation. There was no parallels between the two. They didn't, they didn't cross paths. There was no intersection with the, with the two of them. And unfortunately, it caught up to me when I started thinking about going to college because I was told that I would not be eligible to play sports at the college level for two years because of academics. Oh. Um, and so, of course, in that moment, that was a, an incredible punch in the gut because here I am thinking, wait a minute, I had this whole plan and this goal of mine um, and now it's not going to happen. So I just started to abandon the plan. I said, forget it. And at this point, I've graduated high school. I'm just kind of floating, kind of going through the motions. You're, you're past 18 years old at this point, and you yeah. can't get into college because of your grades. So you're just kind of trying to figure out what you're going to do. Well, here's the thing. Here's the catch. I could actually go to college. I just couldn't play sports at the college level for two huh. years. So I was, okay. in, I was just like, well, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. So no, I'm not going to do it. And that was my stance. And my mother tried to present these other alternatives and these options of going to community school, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I was, my whole thought, my whole approach was, well, if I go to any sort of school, I'm going to lose eligibility. And for a guy of my size and my skill, I need, I need four, four full years to prove that I could actually play. I mean, I was so invested in this dream of being in the NFL that, I mean, if you, I, I listen to myself right now telling you the story of my thought process. And if I, if I would meet that kid, that same kid right now, I'd say, Hey, listen, let's talk about this. Like, <laughs> let's, let's really sit down and let's, let's talk about it. maybe a coach, right? Like, I think you could be an incredible coach. You could be a Bill Belichick. You don't have to be big. You don't have to be, you know, the over the skillfully guy. You can just be smart and, and study and know, right? Like, and you can influence the game in a different way. But I was so stuck on it, and everybody else allowed me to be, to be stuck on it, which to some degree was okay. Like, because I had a goal, I had a dream, and it kept me separated from going down the path that unfortunately was around me of, you know, a lot of negative things that could have potentially tarnished that. Now, the academic side of it, I didn't address that. But I remember here I was, 18 years old, man, and you know, just kind of going through the motions. And one day, I know it sounds cliche to say, but one day I was home on my lunch break and channel surfing. 
and saw something on TV and I thought to myself, huh, maybe that's a solution to the problem that I have. And so what I did is I went and spoke to someone that can give me a lot more information. And needless to say, that individual, um, you know, said, hey, here's all the information you need. You know, let me know if you have any more questions. And I ran home, man. I was so excited. I felt like I had figured it out. I created a viable solution to this problem that I have. And I ran up to my mom and I said, mom, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to join the United States Army. And she said, no. <laughs> Did not, I mean, did not skip a beat at all. I think most mothers would probably relate to that. <laughs> yeah, but but see, this is, and you're right, but this is the diff, This is the, the 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 extra element of what led my mother to immediately say no. My mother, being from El Salvador in the early '80s, there was a civil war that was taking place there. My mother saw what what war does to people. You know what 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 it, what, what happens to families. Yeah. My mother was already exposed to that environment. As I mentioned earlier, my mother had already lost a child. Well, I graduated high school in 2002. And as you and I and a lot of people listening know, 9-11 happened a few months before. We already had troops in Afghanistan. And there are rumors of us going to Iraq. So we as a country were currently at war. So my mother, understanding what war does, understanding that we were currently at war. And if I joined the military, it would increase the chances of her losing another child, her only son. No, you're not. And now, and, and I get it as a young father. Now I have a se seven year old. I completely understand and get it now. Um, but that, you know, there's something that, that, that all of us have that I think we unfortunately lose as we start to grow and get older because of pressures and, um, and responsibilities of, of, of this, this, this attitude of not accepting the no as, as, as an, as an option, as a viable option. Right. Like I remember sitting down, I was like, she was like, no, and she was firm about it. And I was like, well, hold on, let's talk about this. Let me explain why I believe this is a great opportunity for me and why it's the right thing for me to do. And the one thing my mother has always been, you know, is, is she's always been willing to at least listen to what I had to say. And I said to her, I said, you know, it's an opportunity for me to give back to this country that has given a lot to us. It's an opportunity for me to travel, see the world, gain a lot of experience, get a lot more discipline. At the same time, I can get money for college. I can take some college credits while I'm, uh, you know, going in the military, get my grades up. And, and again, I'm still thinking of this football dream. <laughs> while I'm in the military, I can go to school, take some classes, get my GPA up, and I won't lose my eligibility. So when I get out after three years, I'll be 22 years old. I'll be able to go to the NFL or go to college and play at the college level because I'll have the grades and I'll have the money. And then I can go see the NFL. <laughs> I was so focused on this dream, man. <laughs> I like it, though. That was my dream for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think all of us, to some degree, are guilty of that, right? Especially, you know, when, when you're big in a sport, you're like, I'm going to be a baseball player, basketball player. I'm going to be whatever athlete, you know, like you just, you love a sport. You love what it's about. And, you know, you, 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 all of us have these moments and scenarios where we're in the backyard or in the basement or our rooms and we're like, you know, I'm yeah. going to it's March Madness. I'm on the free yeah, throw line. You exactly. know? <laughs> Three, two, one. And you're shooting, you know, a balled up foil into the trash can or something, you know, like, I mean, I, I just remember doing that. And so, you know, so, you know, it was, um, it was, it was, uh, it, 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 you know, it was, it was, it was a tough, you know, scenario in the sense of trying to get my mother to come around to completely support that decision. But she eventually did. And off I went. 11 Bravo, uh, September 12, 2002, 11 Bravo Infantry, yes, sir. Um, went off to basic training for Benning, Georgia. And then, um, in, you know, in, and I was there for three months from, from September to December of 2002. And then in January of 2003, I was assigned to my unit, which was the 101st out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So um, it all happened fast, man. It all happened fast. Wow. So at this point, you've kind of had this incredible childhood where you had a lot of different types of adversity you ran into. And your solution was, 
all right, I'm going to go leave. I'm going to save this, I'm going to, you know, fight for this country as many 18 year olds who decide to go into the service do, especially after an event like 9-11. And then you decide to go infantry, belly up riflemen, and then you're going to go overseas now into Iraq, was it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So six months into, so I got to Fort Campbell in January of 03, um, which at that point I had been in the military four months. Um, and, you know, and just two months later, so six months into m me enlisting, I was on the plane heading over to the Middle East. Um, and 19 years old, I mean, we've heard this story before, and I was on a plane with a lot of men that had been there and had done that to some degree, and a lot in the same situation as myself who had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. And because you don't have extensive training, you know, you only have a certain amount of time to actually get as much training as you possibly can. Um, and so needless to say, you know, it was, um, yeah, it, it was, it, it was challenging. But the one thing that I remember, um, when I got to Iraq is our Colonel, uh, you know, speaking to us one day and saying, you know, the way that he spoke to us and he said, listen, every single one of you matter in this room, every single one of you, despite your rank, despite, you know, what your actual job description is, you matter. And if you don't do your job, I can't do mine and so on. And he gave this incredible speech, which to me has always sat with me. And to me, that is a definition of a true leader that is actually able to get every single one of their troops to buy in, to understand that their role, to take ownership of their role and to be proud of their role. Because what happened shortly after that, Aaron, is, I started thinking to myself, okay, I'm a private. And you know, a private is a glorified intern. Like, I mean, oh, yeah. and, and, and like that, that's all it is. I mean, you have no opinion, you have no voice, you have barely no pay. But suddenly I was proud to be a private. I was proud to have to do a lot of the things that I had to do. And I bought in. And then I remember shortly into a few of our missions and, you know, kind of helping people get from point A to point B and just kind of, I was like, man, I'm a very small part of this process, but I'm a, I'm a part of the process. Yeah. And that in itself is a beautiful feeling. And I haven't experienced, I haven't experienced that anywhere else. Just being and part of a team like that. Yeah. And suddenly this whole thought process of, you know, three years I'm in and I'm out. Then I started thinking to myself, well, I mean, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do this forever because there's nothing else that has gives me the same feeling and gratification as what I'm feeling right now. And so it, it, suddenly my thought process turned into, I want to, I want to be a lifer. And um, yeah. And, and then, and then that was stripped away from me. So tell me about, wow. So a lot of cool leadership lessons. I'm sure we could go really into deep too, just about how, you know, your leader uh, who was a Colonel at the time, comes across in this way and delivers a charismatic speech to create that buy-in for people to let them know how they're part of the bigger mission, right? right? And how it's all connected and how everybody can contribute. I mean, there's so much to learn with just that. And now here you are bought into the team, ready to go, totally on board, gung-ho, ready to kind of go face the next challenge. So then this brings us into the next part of your life, which is where things took a huge shift. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so on the 5th of April of 2003, so a few days shy of being in Iraq a month, full month, um, we were escorting the convoy north to a city called Karbala. And, uh, you know, we escorted the convoy safely to the location. And then, um, and then we were, you know, we were done and we were running back to, you know, our base, I mean, driving back to our base camp. And then suddenly we were told that we had to, you know, pull over and go meet up with a group of guys just, you know, outside of the city of Karbala. And, uh, and the mix of us, you know, finding the new route and deciding, okay, this is the route we're going to take and driving my front left tire, the Humvee that, that I was driving ran over a roadside bomb. Um, there was, uh, uh, I was a driver, there was a passenger and there was two gentlemen that were, um, uh, one was the gunner and one was sitting directly behind the passenger. And, uh, and the other three guys were immediately thrown out of the vehicle. They all walked away with what I call minor physical injuries. Um, and the reason I emphasize that so much is because I want people to understand that, you know, when we, we're in this new space of thinking of veterans, you know, veterans aren't individuals. All of them aren't individuals that look exactly like me, that look 
like the PSA that we see, the pamphlet on a nonprofit organization yeah. that have burns or an amputation or have a service dog or, you know, like the visible wounds. There's so many more of them out there that have the wounds internally that a lot of us don't never, never identify and understand. And so I think it's important for all of us to, for those especially that get the platform and the respect of having the visible wounds and we get people's attention to talk about those individuals that and, and unfortunately had too often fall on the radar. Um, and so, you know, I was trapped inside of the truck and within a matter of, I mean, second, this Humvee was now engulfed in flames. Now here we are now fast forward 10 years later from when I was nine years old, I'm 19 years old, trapped inside of this Humvee, seeing my body, my hands change in a way that honestly we only see in, you know, Hollywood. Right. And gasping for air, like, <gasps> because I had inhalation damage that, um, of where I had lacerated liver, I had broken ribs. So in the mix of me trying to get air and oxygen, all I was doing was inhaling the smoke, which I didn't realize at the time, of course, was doing more damage than anything. Um, and you're and essentially just burning alive at this point. Yeah, essentially, that's, that's exactly what's happening. And so in the mix of me actually, you know, breathing and inhaling all this smoke, I'm doing damage to my insides. And, and all I can think about, man, was, you know, my life. All, all I could think about was what I like to tell people is that that sheet of paper where I wrote down my five, 10, 20 year plan, all the goals and plans I had for myself and how I was never going to get an opportunity to fulfill those and, and pursue those, those dreams and those goals. That's all I can think about. And needless to say, it came down to a point of where I started to get, I started to kind of let go. Like I started to allow my eyes to close and just kind of just let go. I mean, there's no other way to describe it besides simply saying, just let go. And because I, I felt that way, it felt incredibly relaxing um, to just literally let go. But then in my mind, I would think to myself, well, if I close my eyes and if they remain closed for a long period of time, that's it. I've given up and I can't give up. And that's what I would always say is like, I can't give up. Somebody's going to come and save me. And I have to, I have to hang in there. And, and, there was no other basis, no other reason for me to have that thought process besides just me kind of being this overwhelming, overwhelmingly just optimist, right? Of just, no, this can't be it. This can't be it. There has so, to be more. So you made a decision in that time to just stick with it in a way. Yeah. And wow. it was, and there were several times actually, it was, it was, it was definitely, you know, a few times where I had to make that decision for myself and, and, and keep myself kind of fighting. Um, and then, and then suddenly in the form of that, the only form that I've ever seen her and in one picture that my mother has or had, I don't know if she still has it. I see a, a, a visual of my sister appears and I kid you not, man, she appears to me and she speaks to me and she says to me that I'm going to be okay. Wow. Aaron, I'm, I'm telling you not even, <laughs> not even a 10th of a second after that image presents itself. She, I don't know what term you want to use, evaporates, disappears, I don't know, but she goes away and then immediately I was pulled out of the Humvee. And I was pulled out of the Humvee by, by two of my sergeants and I, that began the medevac process to get me back to the States. And suddenly I'm back to the States. Um, you know, I ended up going to Longstreet, Germany. I ended up uh, in San Antonio, Texas at a hospital called Brook Army Medical Center, which is the burn center for the military. And I was in a medical induced coma for three weeks. Um, and I was in this coma. And um, I remember when, they, when, they, when I came out of the coma, um, the doctors, of course, started to inform me of exactly, you know, where I was, what had happened to me. And of course, like every other troop out there, you know, the, the question, the two questions that I had, how were the other guys that were in a truck with me? And they couldn't provide any information. They had no information on those guys, which all that did was disappoint me. And two um, was, well, wait a minute. Um, okay, so when can I go back? Well, unfortunately, you can't. Unfortunately, you're going to be medically discharged from the United States Army. You will no longer be able to be in the United States Army. Immediately, Aaron, within, a, within, within that conversation, however long that conversation lasted, and then also I, I saw my face and my body my identities were stripped away from me. The identity that I had known for 19 years of my life, meaning someone who 
I recognized and I had a relationship with every time I looked in the mirror. The identity of me being a, a strong young man that felt like he could do anything. And then someone who had bought into service and had a purpose in the United States Army and being told that I can no longer fulfill that and no longer get a dose of that in that environment. My identities were taken away from me. And I was devastated. I was in, I mean, I was, it was, it was, it, I was devastated. I mean, there was, there's no other way to put it besides the fact that I was incredibly depressed, frustrated. I was pissed off at everybody that walked into my room, everybody. It didn't matter who it was, my mother and I was upset. And I was in that space for a few weeks um, where I didn't want to talk to anybody. And I did my best to let the world know that I was, I was unhappy. Wow. That, I mean, that's an incredible story. I mean, tell me about when you, so you're, you're covered in most of your body's covered in burns at this point, And it's difficult to even recognize yourself in the mirror. Tell me about what that, how that happened. Like when you looked in the mirror for the first time, or you started to look at yourself, what went through your mind? How did you feel? So pretty much how it transpired was um, within the first, you know, few days of coming out of this medical induced coma, the doctor informed me that, you know, every morning that they would take me to the hospital, I mean, take me to the shower and bathe me because I couldn't do it myself. I mean, physically, I could not walk. I cannot feed myself. I cannot bathe myself. I couldn't do anything for myself. And so they said, you know, every morning, you know, a nurse will come in and feed you breakfast and then they'll put you, you know, uh, on a shower bed and take you to the shower and bathe you. And, and, and that in itself was already, you know, degrading and, um, just felt like I was weak and that, you know, and, oh man, the memories that, that, that surface when I think about that, but you know, it, in the mix of going to the shower, I mean, any burn survivor will tell you that, um, if they remember the incident that, that damaged their body, um, the, the worst part of the whole recovery process is going to the shower. And because now your body's not in that phase of where it's, it's going through a shock and it's numb and you can't feel anything, you have no sensation. Now everything's alive and everything's awake. And so when you don't have, we underestimate what the skin actually does for us. So when you suddenly don't have that layer of skin, you know, protecting you, um, it's painful. And, and the slightest touch, I mean, the slightest tender touch, I mean, it is painful. And sure enough, I experienced that pain and I would scream and yell at the top of my lungs. And I remember going through this for the first few, you know, days after coming out of my coma and because, you know, they still have to clean your body as if, I mean, they have to clean it Um, and they have to take, you know, all that, all that dead skin that's sitting there, all that, I mean, just, just everything that's sitting there. I don't want to give too much for the listeners right now without turn this off, but I mean, you guys, we all have an imagination. We can imagine what, what, what I'm talking about referring to, but I just remember that, you know, after a few days of going through this, uh, being wheeled back into my ICU room and, you know, moving on to the next phase and asking the nurse, um, hey, man, I want to see my face. I want to see my body to fully understand because I couldn't really see my body because um, I couldn't sit up. And every time I was, they sat me up, I was always bandaged. I mean, I had, I mean, I essentially looked like a mummy. Um, And every time they did dressing changes throughout the day, I mean, I was laying down so, and, and, I, and I couldn't really see anything. So I didn't really understand how bad it was. And he, of course, was like, no, it's not the time. It's not the time. It's not the time. And, I, and, and that just wasn't the answer that I wanted. So, of course, I snapped back at him. And pretty much what I said is I'm 19 years old, man. I'm going to have to live with this for the rest of my life. I might as well start learning now what it is that I have to live with. And that was literally what I said to him. Wow. And he said, okay. So he sat me up, he put me in his chair, uh, he put a mirror in front of me, and literally he said, whenever you're ready, there's a mirror in front of you. And I proceeded, I, I proceeded to pick my head up because my head was down and I picked my head up and I looked in the mirror. And the only thing that I can sit here and say to you, man, that I can actually, you know, when people say, what was that moment like? I mean, you know, um, the only thing I can sit here and, and say to you that, um, that, that, that for me, and I know it sounds again, dramatic, but it was, it was, the, I saw a character that terrified me as a child and that was Freddy Krueger. I mean, literally, I know that sounds harsh and that's, and it sounds extreme, 
But when I, when I saw my face, when I saw my body, I mean, I saw a lot of redness, a lot of pinkness, um, a lot of the skin not there, um, a lot of inflammation. I immediately reverted back to that character that terrified me and terrified everybody in the film. And I just thought, what life am I going to have? There's no way that I'll ever be able to, you know, walk down the street. Um, there's no, I mean, I just went, I, my mind just went to this place. I'm 19 years old. I want to have, you know, a wife one day and kids one day. Um, I'll never have that. Um, I mean, my mind went to all of these places and that's of course on t toppled with everything else sent me into that negative space is essentially being depressed. Wow. This is, I can't believe, I can't imagine. I mean, and then you were able to to somehow through something pull through that and build this, this legacy that you left behind. So when, you know, what is, when was the moment where you realized I need to take this mess and turn it into my message or turn it into my story? And at what point were you able to pull yourself out of the depression, which everybody would have given you, they would have let you do it. Right. I mean, it, it's the most, you know, you're a burn victim here and a, and a warrior and a wounded warrior and a hero. And here you are depressed on a bed, not able to recognize yourself. At what point were you able to come out of that? And how did you do that? So there were several moments, right? Like I always tell people like, yeah, there's always one big moment that is essentially the, the umbrella, but there's, there's all of these other moments that uh, fall under that umbrella that are also reminders and also um, signs and, and, you know, directions, no different than if we're, you and I drive in the car and we're trying to get to a destination, you know, there's all these signs that kind of direct us on how to get there. Um, but we have to be willing to obey and kind of listen to the signs, right? And pay attention to them. And so uh, there were several things and I'll just try to kind of give a quick summary. The first one was a few weeks after being in this, this, this state where my mother one day said to me, you listen, all I'm asking you to do is be positive have faith and believe hmm. that's it. And in that moment, Aaron, what I was willing to do was actually listen to my mother, not just hear her. And there's a difference between listening and hearing. And I was actually willing to listen to her and actually say, okay, I'll try that. And so what I say, what I, the visual I create for people when I tell this, 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 this version of my story, this point as I had on this notebook in a sheet of paper where I had this ultimate goal of me being a professional football player, at that moment when my mother said that to me, I had to turn the page and write out new plans and new goals for myself, essentially giving up on the previous page. That football was now out of the equation, that the military was out of the equation. It was now just simply these three short-term goals every single day. Believe, be positive, have faith. That was it. And in the mix of me implementing that, things started to become manageable, right? Well, then I was, um, six months after I was injured, I was kind of going through the motions and a nurse asked me to visit a patient who was equally having a, a difficult time and asked me to go in and talk to him and see if I could you know, help him. And I said, no. And she said, why not? And I said, because I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychiatrist. What if I say the wrong thing? And she said, just go in and talk to him about how things have gotten better for you. Well, needless to say, I went into his room. The room was completely dark in the middle of the day. I walked up to his bed. I introduced myself. And then literally I walked out. And um, before I exited the room, I noticed that he had the light above his bed that was on and the curtain was halfway open. There was light in the room. And something so small said so much to me that I was able to shed some light on this dark road that he was on simply by just talking about what I had been through myself in these last six months. So what I did is every day after that experience, I started visiting patients every single day in between my own appointments. That was my job. That was my role because what I found again, Aaron, was service. What I wow. found again is I had a purpose. And so needless to say, in the mix of me kind of doing these rounds, that was the thing that was keeping me going every single day that kept me excited to wake up in the morning until a year after I was injured. Then I got involved with a nonprofit that assisted veterans. Um, that nonprofit, I'm no longer associated with it because unfortunately, what we too often see with nonprofits, they have not all of them, but they have this great intention when they start off. But unfortunately, something happens along the process and they start to kind of lose the kind of the mission and the understanding of why they're doing it. And then it becomes something else. 
But at that time, I was involved with this nonprofit to assist veterans, and I became a spokesman. And in the mix of me doing all of this, all these interviews on behalf of this nonprofit, I found myself all over the place, all over. I mean, all over TV. And I speak fluent Spanish, so I was everywhere. So then people started calling the hospital saying, hey, that kid that we saw, we'd like for him to come and speak. And I remember the first time it was presented to me to come and speak. And I, and I said, I said, what do you mean speak? Like, what kind of speaking? They said, they want you to do motivational, give you a, give a motivational speech. I said, I can't do that. Like, I can't speak for that long. And I think we've been talking for 40 minutes or so already. You can tell I can clearly talk for that long <laughs> and a lot longer if you allowed me the time, you know. And, but at the time, I was like, there's no way that my story will resonate with people who had not been through the same exact thing that I had been through. That was my interpretation. But the only people I can speak to were veterans. And by just pure kind of insistence on, on their part of like, you know, no, try this, try it. I said, okay. I went to a luncheon. I spoke at the luncheon for the first time. And needless to say, I was able to have, you know, I got some really good feedback from the people that were in the audience. And I just embarked on this journey of, I want to be a motivational speaker and not just any, I wanted to be the best. And you know, listen, there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole other hour we can dedicate to that, you know, but, 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 but to kind of summarize it and keep it short, what, you know, when I got out of the military, I mean, I spent almost three years in the hospital recovering and going through a variety of surgeries. And so by the time I left in 2006, the United States Army, um, I had had over, you know, 30 surgeries. And, uh, but I got out with this interpretation, this idea that I was going to be this motivational speaker and everybody was going to call me. I was going to be like, you know, you're in green, you're, you know, you're, you're close to green Bay. So I was like, I was like the free agent, like Aaron Rodgers, right? Like everybody was going to call me, everybody was going to want me. And it didn't happen that way because immediately everyone identified and categorized me with just being a veteran. And all I can do is talk, talk about war and talk to vets. That was it. And to be honest with you, Aaron, that was incredibly frustrating um, because I felt that people weren't listening and people weren't willing to at least give me an opportunity to prove myself. And I was 22 years old. I was, I was drinking. I was angry. I was resentful because you, it's easy to focus on my physical recovery and what I had to overcome physically. But if the mind's not right, man, it doesn't matter what the body's doing. Absolutely. It doesn't matter what the body's going through. And so what I noticed at that time was now I now had to do the work and recover my mind and my heart. And that was in itself a whole other journey separately that I think is important for, you know, for anybody right now listening to, to, to grasp and to, to, to understand there is absolutely nothing wrong with saying, hey, I feel this way. I think these certain thoughts, I'm frustrated, I have, I'm, I'm, whatever it may be internally that's taking place, we need to verbalize it, we need to be vocal about it in a controlled and a very approachable manner, but we have to find a way to get, to get, that, get that out because I would not be the person I am today. I could have recovered physically perfectly fine and I'm perfectly fine, but if mentally and emotionally, if I wouldn't have looked at it and said, hey, I need to kind of focus on that and fix that element of me, there would be no J.R. Martinez, at least to this, on this level, on this side of the fence. There might be on the other side of the fence, but not on, not what people know today. And I had to do a lot of work, man. And it was a lot of tears, a lot of, a lot of me completely being incredibly honest with myself, having people in my life that were incredibly honest with me and telling me how I was not a pleasant person in, in this way and that way and this way. And me saying to myself, I don't want to be that. I want to change and I want to, how, what do I do? And fast forward 2008, I got an opportunity to audition to become an actor on a soap opera because they were launching a storyline about a veteran. And they thought, what are the odds of us finding a real life veteran with some acting experience? And needless to say, um, I auditioned. <laughs> I was like, I guess I got the part and I was supposed to be on the show for three months, but it turned into three years because, um, I showed up every day. I was willing to learn every day. I was willing to challenge myself. And uh, I didn't go into it with this ego of thinking like, I know it all. And I'm just happy to be here for three months. I mean, I was, but I wanted to, I wanted to make it the best damn three months it possibly can be. And then of course, from there, it just kind of turned into dancing with the stars and then writing the book and then all this speaking, all the speaking engagements and um, you know, essentially kind of what people know today. 
Wow. There's so many, so many incredible lessons in what you just explained there. You know, believe, be positive, have faith. But I want to point out to a word you used when you were in the hospital and you said it was service right. that really started changing you. And I think that, you know, a lot of people out there, they struggle with things, you know, all different varieties and variations and severities. And I think that that seems to be one of the common things that allow people to get through their struggle is when they can start to make it not about themselves, but about how you can use this to help other people. Yeah. And you in that state were able to do that. And that's just incredible. It's, what, it's why you're one of my heroes. And it's just one of the most incredible things when you can do that. Well, you know, I, well, thank you. I mean, thank you for saying that. But I think it's, it's always, you know, look at it this way, because a lot of people have a tendency to look at it and say, well, what's in it for me, right? You know, and I say to those people, I've said, I've said to those people, well, look at it this way. You know, instead of you having to look at yourself, you can look at someone else's shit and you can help them deal with theirs. You don't have to look at yours. You can ignore yours for a little bit. And they always laugh about that. And I'm like, no, seriously, because that's essentially what it does. It gives you an opportunity to try to help somebody else because we're all very good at giving advice to other people, yet we don't follow it ourselves. Sure. But then what happens in the mix of you actually assisting someone else and helping them through their adversity is then suddenly now you, you, you see it start to kind of happen with them, within them, then now it's inspired you to start kind of doing it within yourself, right? So you actually get a lot more in return than what you think, you know, when you set, when you started off on this journey. So it, it really is about getting people to understand and appreciate, you know, hey, listen, there is an exceptional reward when you actually do for others, when you're able to actually assist others, when you're able to get to a point of understanding, it doesn't take a million dollars for you to try to impact someone else's life. Every single one of us right now can do it by using our social media, Instagram, Facebook, um, Snapchat, you know, MySpace, oh, not MySpace, uh, Twitter, nobody's on MySpace, <laughs> Twitter. Twitter. God, I just dated Remember myself, MySpace. Man. Yeah, <laughs> MySpace, everybody. And make sure you upload that song that, you know, when they go to your page, your songs. Yeah, you got like the background <laughs> wallpaper. <I> mean, was... <laughs> uh, but Twitter, like all of us have an opportunity to service someone else by simply just kind of sharing positive information, by simply trying to uplift someone else, by trying to, you know, just try to influence in, in a positive way. I mean, and I think too many of us start to think, well, I'm, I'm in wherever I am. It's a small town or I have limited resources. How can I truly make an impact? Simply by how you interact with someone. Literally, you can be at a coffee shop and it's just simply by saying good morning or someone saying good morning to you or someone opening the door for you and you saying thank you very much. Being open to the signs, being receptive to what the world is going to put in front of you because the world is constantly putting things in front of you. I can't tell you how many times, Aaron, I've had these moments of where I'm having kind of a, you know, one of those days, because I'm still human, and I have one of those days, and suddenly there's somebody that I just come in contact with that says something to me, that shares something with me, whether they know who I am or not, and suddenly I walk away from that, and I'm like, thank God I was willing to actually be receptive to that information, because it really has, it really helped me. It changed everything about with kind of my mood and, and, and my energy, uh, and, and it's helped me incredibly, and so you know, I just want people to understand that I, I think there's a lot, of, you know, you, everyone's going to take away what they feel is important to them at this juncture in their life. But I, I want people to be able to, to take a lot of what I share and a lot of what your other guests share and what you share and whether it applies to you at this point in, your, in time in your life, doesn't matter. Just take all of it and put it in your pocket because it's like walking down the street and encountering a penny or loose change on the ground. Many of us will say, well, we don't need that. We'll just, you know, we got money in our pocket and we'll just keep moving on. But then let's say, for example, you have 20 bucks in your pocket and you're going to lunch and you walk over, step over a penny. You're like, I don't need it. I have 20 bucks. And you get to the spot where you're going to lunch and then they ring you up and they say, that'll be $20 and one cent. Now you're suddenly trying to go back and find that penny, but someone else picked it up. Yeah. The point is at that point in your life, when you encounter that penny, you didn't think I need, I don't need this penny right now. But you still pick it up and you still put it in your pocket because a few steps ahead, you're going to need that penny. You're going to need that nickel, that dime, that dollar, whatever it is. You're going to need that lesson. You're going to need that advice. You're going to need that individual. And it's important for all of us to actually take that lesson with us when we're listening to you and all the guests that you have on your show and say, there's something that, that they have talked about, that they've experienced that we can take away from this. My life is purely based on service, as having a purpose, 
how do I, how am I making people feel? How do I interact with people? I want people when they walk away from J.R. Martinez to say, man, that dude is a cool dude and he's genuinely that dude. And you know, he's a good, you know, he made me feel a certain way. That's what I want people to take away from this. So I, want, good. I want people to say, you know what? Yeah, it's hard right now. It's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly challenging right now. Absolutely. Aaron, I, after dancing with the stars, after I wrote my book, after speaking all over the world, guess what happened? Nobody called me anymore. And then guess what happened? Suddenly there wasn't the same amount of money that was coming in. I got to a point, Aaron, where I almost lost it all. And so finally I found myself in the back end, suddenly now having to build up again back in 2015, 16, where I had to suddenly start to kind of figure out, okay, how do I do this again? Because that's the way life is. It's that revolving, you know, wheel where sometimes you're at the top, sometimes you're at the bottom. And that's I had such a good point too. I mean, yeah. like how everybody goes in those cycles, right? And I'm, I'm glad you shared that because it's like, you know, you have these experiences and just because people are at the top at some point doesn't mean it's not linear, right? It's sick. Right. Yeah. It. And you have to always be thinking as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a brand, um, as an individual. I mean, because you as an individual, you are a brand and you have to understand that and, 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 and be open to that. But you then have to start thinking kind of, okay, there's success that is taking place right now, but in the mix of enjoying the success, you had to be preparing for when that downtime is going to come and you had to be preparing for what the next stage is going to be. If you want that to, to, if you want that to be, you know, consistent as far as you being at the top. And so what I didn't do is I just kind of was just going and suddenly I found myself at the bottom again. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, this is not something that happened. Right. But guess what, Aaron? And I'm completely vulnerable and I'm open to, and I'm cool with sharing this. And in, in relative, relative to my prior success, I'm essentially at the bottom now where, yes, I'm busy, but I'm not as busy. As, there's not as much going on. But you know what that's forced me to do? That's forced me to look internally and kind of realize, okay, what do I need to work on? What do I need to address on the back end? You know, what do I need to, from a promotional standpoint, what do I need to do as my brand? What are my speaking points? What are my speaking topics? How am I, are people seeing all of these questions that come along with it? What services am I providing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do I be better? And instead of sitting here and just, oh man, well, I, years ago, I was this and I was that and I had this success and now I'm just pissed off because now I'm not there anymore. Yeah, I'm pissed about it, but all that's gonna do is fuel my motivation to sit here and say, I need to do the work and figure it out. And the way that I was honest with myself, you know, 13 years ago, I need to be honest with myself once again and be completely accountable and take ownership of the goods and the bads. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to ask you too. It's just, you know, what really keeps you going? And then you just hit it right on the head. It's just about being honest with yourself. And is this the standard that you want to live by? You know what? what, what what keeps me going is there, there, there. It is that, but it's this. It's this. You and I both know a lot of individuals who have served in the military that didn't make it back. I was granted an opportunity, you know, to have a second chance at life, and so for me, my motivation stems from that. I understand that when Memorial Day comes around, we're honoring those that made the ultimate sacrifice, and I easily could have been one of those individuals, but I'm not. And thank God I'm here today and I have an opportunity to have an incredible life. And so for me, my motivation is not to waste that opportunity because there's so many other veterans that would have loved that opportunity. There's so many families that would have loved that opportunity to have. Mm. Their life. So for me, my drive and my fuel is a little bit deeper, but it's also just stemming from this fact that, you know what, the world is, is, is belongs to every single one of us. And it's our responsibility and our duty to go out there and actually do with it what we wish. And unfortunately we see people that wish the negative. Um, but I know there's a lot of people out there that wish the positive. And I encourage whoever it is listening to right now that is going to that is going through a negative time in their life that is going to be going through a negative time in their life because life is not fair. That's the way life operates is to stick with it is to surround yourself is to be honest is to look at yourself is to understand what are some things that I need to ch do in my life that I need to change. What are some circles that maybe I need to kind of step away, from, step away from? What are some environments and communities that I maybe need to kind of transition out of? What are some things that I need to do in order to achieve what I ultimately want to achieve? 
And that is a conversation that every single one of us in our lives have to have with ourselves. And if we don't, we're lying to ourselves. And we're setting, we're setting ourselves up for failure and we're setting ourselves up ultimately to just be forgotten. Gosh, that's it's so powerful just to re realize that, especially when you say it like that, it just what a gift life is to us, right? And for those of yeah. you that, that listeners that haven't served or don't even know people that serve, but just understand the, the beauty of life and the gift it is to us and how other people don't have that all the time. Right. And that, you know, I think that well, that's it, just it, something wonderful it, to look at. Yeah, and it's, you know what, man? There's too many people and, 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 and I've encountered them and some of them are my family and some of them are my friends. And I'm not speaking down, I'm not trying to, but this is kind of where my passion comes through because I, 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 in the mix of me trying to achieve success and obtain it, I'm trying to bring everybody with me. Like, come on, let's get, there's enough right. wagon, right? And there's too many people that I've encountered that aren't necessarily where, you know, their plans and goals and vision that they were going to be. And they have this incredibly sour attitude about where they are. And I get it. It's not what you thought for yourself. But instead, once you look at the opportunity where you are right now and look at it as, as an opportunity, you have an opportunity, you have employment. It may be limited, it may not be what you want it to be, but there is an opportunity. And the rest, now that is on you. How are you going to show up? How are you going to interact with your colleagues? How are you going to interact with the customers? What service are you gonna provide for them? How are you going to be memorable in the sense of when people walk away from the interaction with you, are they gonna say, that was pleasant? That's somebody I wanna to continue to work with. That's somebody that I would actually look to hire for my business or my company or my service, whatever it is. Or are they gonna remember you as someone that's like, I never wanna go back to that location because of that individual. We too often get caught up in that mindset of thinking like, you know what? No, this isn't where I want to be. And I dread this every single day. Instead, show up and show out and actually leave an impression on somebody. That, my friends, you cannot blame on the world and anybody else. That is now your responsibility. That is your choice. And if you don't take ownership of that, then you are the reason and the sole reason as to why you will always be in that state of mind, feeling completely like you've missed the boat. That is nobody else's, nobody else's job. That is yours. And that is something that a lot of people have to grasp and understand. There was a lot of situations in my life I didn't want to be in, but I was there. And I found a way to kind of just say, you know what, there's something that I can take away from this because there's a reason I'm here. There's something I'm supposed to learn and gain. And I did. And thank God I did. And thank God I stuck with it because now when the, when the, when the negative comes, when the tough times come, Aaron, I don't panic because I've been through it before. Now I'm like, I'm good. There's, there's a reason. I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to ride this out a little bit. It's a little bumpy, but just bear with it. It's going to get better. And it does. Oh, powerful. Wow. You're getting me going over here, man. <laughs> no, this is good stuff. And this is, this is wonderful. Um, we're running down on time here, but I, I want one last question from you. Yes, sir. And the last question is just, you know, what are you working on now to kind of take, you know, you and, and your mission and, and this, this story that you have to the next level, anything that you, you have going on? You know, the biggest thing right now is, like I said, I'm doing a lot of that back end work. I mean, I appreciate the question. I mean, I'm, I'm at the place now in my life and my career where it's just kind of, you know, looking at my brand and kind of saying, okay, how am I going to get this material out to people? You know, what are some better ways that as a speaker, um, as an actor, as a host, as, you know, uh, as an individual, how do I, how do I get better? Um, what are some things that I need to kind of transition into? I mean, and, you know, it's, you would appreciate this. I mean, you know, I, I, from an entertainment standpoint, I had someone reach out to me about an opportunity and, you know, ultimately it came down to, they picked someone else because that person had more, more of a social media following. And that was incredibly devastating to, for me to hear because <laughs> I'm like, that's what, that's the world we live in now where it's almost like a popularity contest in some yeah, way. Right. <laughs> but I get it. Right. Like it's tough, but I get it. But what it's forced me to do is uh, now focus on, okay, that's the part of my business that I have to build. That's the part of the business that I have to continue to grow and, and be honest with myself. So at this point, honestly, I'm just working on, you know, being a better motivational speaker, um, you know, kind of polishing up my brand, coming up with fresh new content for my brand, doing all the unsexy things that no one ever wants to do. I wish I can say to you right now, oh, I'm working on this big film or I'm working on this TV show. I have 50 gigs lined up right now. I don't. But my time and my energy is occupied right now by simply looking at my brand and looking at my business and my model and saying, what do I need to, need to do differently? And who do I need to reach out to that can help me 
uh, escalate my services and my brand to the next level. And that's the work that is unsexy, but it's the work that's necessary if you want to have longevity. And I think that I appreciate you sharing that too, because a lot of people don't see that, right? Is yeah. they just they just see the highlight reel, they see the films, they see the speaking, they see uh, the travel and all this other fun stuff, but they don't see that like there is work that goes into all this, right? You're right. building a brand, you're building a personal brand, you're building a business. I think I appreciate you sharing that too, because it's just so many people think it's all just the highlight reel, especially the way social media is today, right? You don't yeah. see the back end of it, and I think that's crazy. And anybody listening here needs to go out. And follow this guy as well, because if you ever, ever need a speaker or anything like that, you're always on game, right? So what is it, jrmartinez.com? I, I, uh, website is jrmartinez.com, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Not MySpace, not MySpace. Not MySpace, but, uh, guys, just <laughs> in case you were confused before. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's at I am JR Martinez, but my website is jrmartinez.com, but my handles are at I am JR Martinez.com. But, um, Hey, listen, Aaron, I just want to say, man, you know, before we pop off, man, thank you so much for the opportunity. Continue the great work that you're doing, man. I think all of us, you know, um, if we all do this together and share the same message together, then we impact the world in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger way versus just relying on one or two or five individuals to do it. I think if we all collectively understand our roles and we do it and we work as a team, uh, we make the world a better place. And that's what we need to strive for this day and age. Absolutely. Gosh, thank you so much, JR, for coming on the show today. Hey, man, it was a pleasure, man. Once again, guys, this is Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews. You can find more about me at Aaron Armstrong 33 on Instagram, or you can go to my website, AaronJArmstrong.com. Thanks a lot, everybody, for listening through to the end. Go be somebody.